Looking forward to our Family Connect as all three campuses uh, will be together for the month of July. Uh, all three campuses uh, have been in a series that we have called Ambassadors. And the entire point, I guess you could say the purpose of this series has been for us to see that God is interested and involved in every area of our life. Everything we do matters to God, and we represent Him in all things that we do. So this morning, uh, it's going to be the last message in the Ambassador series. So if you have your Bible, take those out, turn those on. The book of Colossians. Colossians is found uh, in the New Testament near the end of your Bible, Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to focus in on two verses today, verse number 23 and verse number 24. And so God wants to be a part of your play. He wants to be a part of your parenting. He wants to be a part of your exercise and your hobbies, your politics and your families, your friends and your finances. And we're going to learn today, God also wants to be a part of your work. And that is because all of the things that we do are special. Spiritual. Now, uh, we could have just preached through the book of Leviticus today, but I thought more of you would be interested if we turned to Colossians. So Colossians 3, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we recognize the authority of God's Word, the Holy Bible. Colossians 3, starting in verse 23. Whatever you do. Did you get that? Like... So what? It doesn't matter what. It's like whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know, or maybe you didn't know, that you are going to receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So today, as we wrap up this series, we want to talk about how you and I can be an ambassador in the workplace. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. God, what a great day. Uh, just being together with so many of our friends and church family. And Lord, uh, to be able to worship you, to serve you, to give to you. And God, now as we open up your word, we want to learn from you. God, we desire that you would help us if we go to the right or if we go to the left. That we would walk in your way and especially in the way of our working or our schooling. And so God, help us to be an ambassador in all places at all times. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. You know, most Christians, I think, believe that an ambassador is something that you do when you go on a mission trip. We're going to be commissioning a group today. We have two other mission trips going out this month, and I want to invite you next uh, Sunday to lunch. Uh, for any of you that have sponsored uh, one of the uh, Children Through Compassion International, we're having a free lunch for you and your family, and if you're interested in sponsoring a child through that partnership with Compassion, would love Love to have you at the lunch uh, next week, but out of that, we're also going to be taking a mission trip. And a lot of people think, you know, when you're on a mission trip, that's when you're an ambassador. Maybe uh, when you're here at church, you served at VBS. Lance and Michael talked about serving at camp and how God worked and, and the incredible things that happened there. We think, oh, when you're there, you're an ambassador. But Colossians teaches us that no, it's in whatever you do. Work as if you're working unto the Lord because that is who you are serving. So we've all been called to be an ambassador, an ambassador everywhere and anywhere we go. And one of those everywhere, anywhere places that we so often go is in our workplace or in our schooling or with inside our family. You know, work was never supposed to be just a job if you are a believer in Christ. In Christ, work is a part of God's plan. It's a part of God's purpose for you. And so this morning, here's what my uh, task is. And I would tell you, uh, outside of Chris, 
speaking on politics, uh, this may be the most difficult task. And that is to try to convince you uh, in a new way to think about work. Because simply a lot of us, uh, we just see work as a paycheck uh, to purchase more things or to provide for our family. And that's not at all how God sees it. So today, uh, we're going to look into the scripture. We're going to look into the Bible this morning. And we're going to uh, see how God views the workplace, how God views whatever it is we may do that we are to do so as an ambassador. And I really think uh, that this has the potential to absolutely transform the way that you go to work, maybe some of you today, if not others of you on Monday, and this is a timely message, since most of you have had three or four days off, you're like, I didn't even want to think about work, and now you're going to preach on work? This isn't where I wanted this to go, but the Bible actually does have a lot to say about work and your attitudes and actions towards that. So we really have two big points today. The first one is this, a scriptural overview. Like, I don't want you to think this is just a TED Talk or this is just a podcast. Uh, this is just someone sharing their opinions. Like, the Bible has a lot to say about this. And the first thing the Bible tells us is that God himself is a creator. Look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis 1, 1 tells us this. In the beginning, now when we say beginning there, we mean when God is going to establish time because God has always been. There's never been a time that God was not. But then God's going to create. In the beginning, God does what? He created. Another term there could be the term work. God created. He worked so that the heavens and the earth could be formed. I think sometimes we forget that in the very first verse of Scripture, God is at work. So this scriptural overview, one of the things we're going to see this morning is that God is a worker. The fact that God calls what he did when he created work and that he also calls that good means this. Work is significant. It's a significant part of who God is and, and therefore it should be significant in what we do. It has intrinsic value. So when God opens up the scenes of Genesis 1 for us, what is he doing? God is working. Creator God is making the moon, the sun, the stars. And I love when the Bible describes how God made the stars. It's almost as if he forgot, right? Like the moon and the stars. And Oh, oh yeah, I threw the stars out there. Uh, oh, oh, I would have led with that, right? Like how amazing. But it was nothing in the work of of God. He's calling things into existence. He's creating the oceans, the land, the birds, and the animal. He speaks, and the world explodes into color, and it takes shape and form and fashion. Did you realize 12 times in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, God is described as one who is working by creating by making, by forming, fashioning, and planting. Genesis 2.2 says this. By the seventh day, God had what? Finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, God rested from all his, what's the key word? From his work, right? So according to Genesis 2, how many days did God work? Or six, if you wanted to participate this month. I, I hope over in the West, uh, I, I, I think I heard a few voices through the different uh, doors there. Uh, how many days, according to Genesis 2, did God work? Six. Man, you guys are the smart crowd. And, and then what did God do on the seventh day? God what? Rested. There we go, right? But watch this. When did God rest? Oh, and this is where we go. Hang on. Trick question. Did God rest because it was the seventh day? No. When did God rest? He rested when the work was what? Completed. 
when he completed the work. Uh, Pastor Chris and I spent a lot of time together. Matter, matter of fact, a lot of people ask us about our relationship. But the thing I would tell you is, uh, much like what we did in parenting, we just spent a lot of time together. And we talk a lot. And, and we were talking about this disconnect. Because a lot of people, my generation and especially older, a lot of those over in our West Auditorium, we call them our senior saints. Uh, a, a lot of us can get caught up in uh, worshiping work. Like, well, you can find your identity in your work. As a matter of fact, very guilty of if somebody takes a day off or if they take a vacation. When they come back, everyone's like, oh, who's the new guy? Who's the new girl? Oh, welcome back. Do you work here? And it's like, uh, that's absolutely wrong, by the way. Like, that's not biblical. And then Chris, and by the way, I was the one who was bringing that to the table. And so uh, Chris brings to the table, well, JJ, here's the issue, though, with, with the generation below you, right? Like, we just worship Sabbath. You know, you, man, you, he goes, you've never heard Sabbath mentioned more in the last few years than you've ever heard. Like, and I can tell you, it, growing up, I never heard a message on Sabbath. No, no one talked about Shabbat. Like, what are you speaking of, right? But here's the thing. We have a generation today that doesn't want to complete the work. But, man, do they want a Sabbath. And I would tell you this. That's also wrong, right? What, did, what happened? God worked. He completed the work. And then God enjoyed the rest. He enjoyed the Sabbath. Now, I would tell you, you've got to be careful on both sides. Because, again, a lot of you in here, you know, laugh. I promise you in the next service when we have a lot of young adults, they're going to kind of look at this first part of that like, oh, man, yeah, my, my parents, my grandparents, work was their idol. It was their, matter of fact, that's why I don't work. Because mom and dad were always at work. And one of the things, by the way, parenting, I know that was last week. Uh, but one of the geniuses, genius things that Sharon did, uh, because I am a pastor, right? Um, she, she always made sure that she separated work and church. So if the boys ever said, hey, where's dad? She didn't say dad's at church. Dad goes to church on Sunday, like everybody else, but she would always say, Dad's at work, right? And, and, and you need to understand, there's a difference between Sabbath and working. And both of those can be done in harmony, but both of those need to be done in a way that glorify the Lord. Uh, not only did God work, but Jesus worked. You know, we don't have a lot of information about Jesus from the age of 12 until he's 30, except for this. Uh, we understand that he would have been in his father's business. Uh, the translation is carpenter. Most of us probably think of working with wood, but more than likely, that's like a stonemason, somebody who would have worked with rocks, that type of material. And so Jesus showed that not only is physical work necessary, but Jesus even taught us that physical work is good, but he also modeled an attitude of work by fulfilling the work that he was called to do. And let's just deviate for a moment. Look at John 17. Jesus is praying, and in verse 4, he says this, and he's praying to his Father in heaven, I have brought you glory on earth by what? Finishing the work you gave me to do. I had to finish. Now, notice what did God say? After he completed the work, after he finished the work, he rested. After Jesus has finished the work, what is he going to do? He's going to give up his body. He's going to allow it to rest. So whereas the first Adam made work very difficult, Jesus, who we refer to as the last Adam, through his work on the cross, he's made it possible for you and I to have a right relationship with God and also to change our attitude in regard to work so that we realize that it is a purpose. There's 
purpose for you working. That you can bring honor and glory just as Jesus did. said, I have brought you glory. And so the question we have to look is, in our work, could we pray the same prayer at the end of the day? God, today I brought you glory. And in, in, in what you have called me to do, and remember what, well, well, what is that? Whatever, it doesn't matter. And whatever it is, I brought you glory and I finished the work for the day. And so God is a worker. And if God is a worker, that means you and I also were created to work. God wants us to be a worker. Genesis 1.27 says this. So God created. He worked. He spoke into existence mankind. And he made mankind how? In his own image. Now, that doesn't mean physical. Remember, God is a spirit. But in the characteristics of God, in the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. And since God is a worker and we are created in God's image, we are designed to be workers as well. And, and here's what I would remind you of, especially like our younger generation. Anything that God has designed, anything that God has given purpose to, I, I would tell you a couple of those things. Uh, marriage being one, uh, the church being one, and I would even say work being another, um, then the enemy makes sure that's a fight. The enemy makes sure that's going to be a battle. Because the enemy does not want in the things in which God has ordained, God has sanctioned, God has called out to bring him glory. The enemy doesn't want God to receive the glory that he so desires and deserves. So since God is a worker, we created in his image, we are designed to work as well. Genesis 2.15 says this, The Lord God took the man... And he put him, so who, who put him there? God did. God placed him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it and to care of it. So Adam's given the responsibility to care for God's creation. By the way, there are a lot of great theologians that say this. That when God created, when God worked, he declared it what? Good. Therefore, God then put Adam into the good place that he created to do what? To work it. You know what some theologians believe? That the word good there is not the word perfect, but that the word that God put Adam there to work it is the word perfect. As in this, that God left some things for you and I to do. That God says, I want you to continue in this work. And so Adam's given this responsibility of caring for what God had created by working it, subduing it, ruling over it, and increasing upon it. So Adam's life in the garden, uh, it was not one of laziness. It was not one of, he had Sabbath seven days a week. No, he had work to do. Now, I would tell you this. Uh, Sharon and I were talking about this even yesterday. It was far less demanding than it was, would become after the fall. But notice something. Adam wasn't just spending time in the garden singing worship songs and reading, you know, both chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, that's all he would have had, and praying. No, Adam was worshiping his father by doing what? By doing the work that God had created him to do. So working is one of the main ways that you and I can reflect the image of God in the world in which we live. That working is one of the ways that you and I can be an ambassador for Christ. But unfortunately, most people just see work or jobs as a necessity that must be endured so that you can put food on the table and take a picture of it so that you can put it on Instagram. like that. But that's not it. Like there's far more. And, and if most people believe that, you know, if God was interested in work, 
uh, probably the only thing God would be interested in is maybe that we didn't cheat and that we tithe off of our salaries. But beyond that, he really doesn't care. And, and so, uh, therefore, a lot of people don't enjoy their job because they think that work was a part of the original curse, right? Um, Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God, and then they got cursed with work. But work was created, work was designed for man even before the fall. So I don't want you to think that work is something that we do because Adam and Eve sinned. No. Work is something that we do because God created us that way. Like God has designed us that way. Genesis 2.15 says this. Remember we read this earlier. The Lord God took the man... Put him in the garden of Eden to what? Work. Let me read it one more time. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to do what? Work. All right? To work it, to take care of it. Uh, this is fascinating. If you go back and look at the original Hebrew word for work, you know what it translates? Worship. God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to what? To worship and to take care of it. So one of the number one ways that we reflect the image of God, one of the number one ways that we serve as an ambassador representing Christ, one of the number one ways that we worship God is through our worship. So now, uh, a word of clarification. Um, when Adam and Eve sinned, we, we refer to that as the fall. Um, God did curse the ground, okay? Look at this in Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Curse is the ground because of you, Adam and Eve, because of their sin. And through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field, and by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. But regardless then of how difficult work may now be, our work, if done unto the Lord, is more worshipful than even what we did this morning. But again, I think when we think worship, we think about what we did this morning and not what we're going to do tomorrow morning. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, if you have time later today, read Exodus 31. Exodus 31 is this incredible chapter uh, of God calling uh, several people, but especially two. And, and Moses says this about them. They were filled with the Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, the God the Spirit had not come yet, right? We see glimpses of this. Matter of fact, David prays a prayer that in today's day, you and I don't have to pray. David says this, Lord, do not allow your Spirit to depart from me. Now, you and I have been sealed with the Spirit. If we are believers in Jesus, if we've been saved by Christ, then the Spirit of God dwells inside of us. But in the Old Testament, that wasn't the case yet. And so we see that they were filled with the Spirit. But how did they express that? Did they go about singing and playing? No. You know what they did? They were experts in their field of work. In their field of work. That's how they displayed the being filled with the Spirit in working in an excellent way, which was classified as worship to God. Um, C.S. Lewis, who is a brilliant writer, uh, C.S. Lewis had this thought, right? Maybe many of you have thought this before. Uh, he once noted how valleys undiscovered by human eyes are still filled with like beautiful flowers. And then C.S. Lewis asks, for whom did God create this beauty if no human eyes would ever see it? And then Lewis would answer his own question. Much of his writing would be that. 
And Lewis would say, God does some things only for his own pleasure. He sees even when no one else does. You know, as an ambassador of Christ, can I just encourage you that you would make beautiful things for God even when no one else may see. Even when no one else may notice. Even when you find out, hey, the boss person is going to be out of town next week. Guess what? You're going to show up and you're still going to put in the day's worth of work. You're going to still work with excellence. You go, well, no one's going to see it. It doesn't matter. You're not working for them. You're working unto the Lord. And, of course, that can apply in so many different ways. So as ambassadors of Christ, let me encourage you to do that. To make beautiful things for God even when no one else notices. I I love Martin Luther King Jr.'s thoughts on this. He said, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets as even Michelangelo painted, as Beethoven composed music, or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth would pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. I love that. So whatever it is that you've been called to do. So mom, understand that when you take that washcloth and you give your baby a bath, you know what you're doing? You're worshiping. Guess what, Dad, when you drive your kids to practice and you drop them off and you're waiting there in the stands and it's burning up hot and the storm's going to come, you know what you're really doing? Worshiping. Guess what, when you care for an aging parent and the roles are reversed and when you're caring for their health needs, you know what you're really doing? You're not working, you're worshiping. And now let's transition not just the scriptural thoughts on working, But what's the significance of work, right? So why do we work? A lot of people think that there's a difference between like a calling and a career. That they would say, well, a career is like a secular job. By the way, the word secular is not in the Bible. So I don't know where we come up with that. But it's a secular job. and, And then a calling would be like a spiritual job. You know, like when you do church work, like what Chris and I do. A lot of times they'll go, well, yeah, but you have a calling on your life. But I want you to know that like, that's simply not true. As much as I have a calling on my life, as much as Chris has a calling on your life, so do you. It, it just looks, it's just played out different. But both of us are called to work, and in our calling to work, we are to worship God in that. You know, I, when it came to parenting, uh, we didn't have many people that wanted to do a video, right? Uh, a lot of people were like, yeah, I think we'll pass. We're just going to sit here and listen. Uh, but when it came to work, can I just tell you that so many of your names came up? I mean, we could have done a video after video after video because so many of you do this well. Uh, that in your work, uh, you, you honor the Lord, uh, you bring glory to Him. But, but we chose two people, and I think once you hear their story and recognize who they are, you're going to go, yeah, of course. Uh, Brent and Monty Wirtz have been a part of our church for a long time. Both of them work in two separate fields, but in both of their independent fields of one another, both of them know that it's a calling on their life to do what they do. So I want you to hear the words of Monty and Brent regarding work. Hi, my name is Monty Wirtz, and I've been at STF now for 24 years, back when it was Davis Islands Baptist, and I work in higher education. And my name is Brent Wirtz, and uh, I work in the investment industry. Uh, We have an SEC registered investment advisor that serves local governments in the state of Florida and Texas. You know, when I thought about this question and and thinking about what an ambassador for Christ in the workplace looks like, uh, I would describe myself as a work in progress. Uh, The experiences that I've had at STF serving on different committees, different opportunities to facilitate Bible studies and community groups and 
be involved in, in mission trips uh, around the globe have kind of shaped my, you know, my role as an ambassador for Christ in different areas of my life. And for a long time, I compartmentalized that and did not take Christ into the workplace. But as the Lord continued to allow me to experience Him and grow in my trust and deepen my relationship with Him, it allowed me to flourish and start to turn over different areas of my life, including the workplace. Uh, we started out with, with prayer groups uh, for our employees where we would pray, week, pray weekly with each other. Um, but it's evolved into being intentional uh, in my conversations with vendors, brokers, clients about mission trips, the opportunities to, to go and experience the Lord in different places. And from that, it's, it's led to conversations of, well, why do you take vacation and, and go to another country away from your family and do this? And that's presented the opportunity to share about my relationship with the Lord. It's presented the opportunity to pray with people and see, you know, bringing that intentionality and see what that relationship's like. But, but being intentional with listening and being engaged and, and just loving on people where they are, whether it's through encouragement, whether it's through prayer, whether it's through an opportunity to share the truth and share the gospel. I think kind of building on what Brent has said about the time that you spend in the workplace, um, God has really always spoken in my heart just from the very beginning of my career that there's humanity to us that's important that we show in the workplace. You know, knowing that that you're a Christian and seeing that can be really different, and that it's and that it's okay for people to watch um, the struggles that I go through and see how how I respond to that. And it's not always perfect, and that people can see the forgiveness that I have and the grace and the mercy that I experience, and that that may be interesting to them, and that they see how my reactions are different. And as I evolve um, in my understanding of what being an ambassador uh, for Christ is in the workplace, I'm beginning to understand. Uh, that it's all about servanthood, that you know, my being in the workplace is not about me at all. It's about my service to God and it's about my service to others. And I think what he's talked to me a lot about is the best way I can do that is to be excellent at what I do. Um, I, in the job that I have, a lot of it is crisis management. And so I get into some tough spots and have tough conversations. And recently I was having a conversation with my daughter as I was walking through one of those seasons and she was saying, you know, mom, I'm really sorry you're having to do, you know, some of this. And just out of my mouth came, you know, really the best thing I can do right now for for the people that I'm working with and the situation I'm walking through is to just be really, really good at what I'm doing. And that's what love looks like. And I thought, you know, that's really true, that how I can love people is to really be good. And I thought about Daniel and I thought about Joseph in the Old Testament and what brought them to the attention of people, the leadership of the time, and what brought glory to God in those situations were that they were really good at what they did. And I thought, you know, Lord, that's what I need to be pursuing is excellence, not so that I get accolades or gold stars, but that so people glorify you through what I do. And I think the motivation is, is, is the difference. I love what Monty said there. To be an ambassador for Christ, you know what I have realized I had to do? Be really, really good at what I do. That's it. Show up at work and be really, really good at what you do. So a calling doesn't mean that you're a pastor. It doesn't mean that you're a missionary. If you're a business person, an entrepreneur, maybe you're an executive or you work for a firm or a bank or you work for yourself, maybe you serve in the military or you're an officer or a first responder. By the way, thank you for your service. But Colossians 3 would tell us that we are to work with all of our heart as if we are working for the Lord. That means this, that every job is a calling. It's an opportunity for you to worship God at work. It's an opportunity, as Monty again said, for you to serve those around you. And the Lord needs ambassadors who are writers, who are performers, who are artists, speakers, politicians, judges, businessmen and women, and workers in every craft, in every trade, because you are ministers in the workplace. And that's why being an ambassador at work is one of the highest callings. You know, someone said there are two great days of your life. The first is the day that you were born. 
But then the second is the day that you find out why you were born. And I would say two things. One, so that you can experience salvation. So that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus. But then also, secondly, is for your vocation. You know, our friend Jim Wilson would tell us this. That the word vocation comes from a Latin word, voce. And that means this, voice or call. In other words, God's voice is calling you. For you to be the best student that you can be. For you to be the best son or daughter that you can be. For you to be the best parent or grandparent for you to be. For you to be the best worker in whatever place you work that you can be. And it should bring about a divine satisfaction. So why or who is it that we are working for? Colossians 3 would remind us, it is the Lord Jesus Christ that you are serving. So listen, I I don't know who your boss is. I don't know who he or she is that you report to or maybe who you are accountable to. And by the way, having human authority is a good thing. Uh, But ultimately, our authority is not a man, a woman, or a board. Our authority is the Lord, meaning that is who we work for. So whatever Whenever you work, if you're a graphic designer, maybe you're a teacher, a dance instructor, an artist, a salesperson, a a nurse, or a waitress, maybe a lawyer, a CFO, whatever it is that you are, a construction worker, someone who repairs cars, or maybe you are a stay-at-home parent, whatever it is, your work is significant because your work is a way For you to serve the Lord and hence to worship the Lord. You know, I don't think it's coincidental that most of the parables that Jesus told had a workplace context. Matter of fact, of the 40 miracles that are reported in the book of Acts, did you realize that 39 of them happen outside the church? Not inside the church? No, what does that tell us? That God is concerned with displaying His power and His glory and His might outside the church walls. And that's where I would tell you, man, I'm jealous of you. Like that's where you have a huge environment or, or advantage, right? Like we're, most of the time we're kind of stuck inside the church while you get to go and display the Lord's glory in the different places of where God has called you to work. And I want to remind you, um, even though I may not know your bosses, uh, even though I may not know every single person you work with, can I tell you three things about every person you're going to encounter tomorrow? Number one, probably they're going through a tough time. Number two, uh, they probably have a hidden hurt. And number three, I bet they could use a lift. Like, I bet they could use a prayer or a word of encouragement. So tomorrow, when you go to work, uh, ask the Lord to give you a new perspective of the people that you're working with and who it is that you're working for. Now, if you're interested in knowing more about being an ambassador in the workplace, uh, Focus on the Family has created uh, this video series with quarterback Kirk Cousin. Now, we love Kirk outside of two Sundays of the year. But beyond that, he is an awesome guy. But if you want to know more about being an ambassador in the workplace, uh, Kirk says this, as an NFL quarterback, I know reflect Christ is in high pressure situations can be hard. That's why I want you to have my free new video series with my story and advice on becoming an ambassador for Jesus in your work and in your family. 1 Corinthians 15 58 says this, therefore my dear brothers and sisters stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully To the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is not in vain. I want to close out our ambassador series with a parable. Uh, A parable maybe some of you have heard before. It's been told of a carpenter 
who was on the verge of retirement. And he was lured into building one more home, but he thought this home that he was building was for his boss. And so the carpenter pressed by his own thoughts that he had worked so many years. He decided for the first time, to cut corners so that he could finish quickly on this home. He used inferior materials. His workmanship was suspect and at best. And clearly, his heart wasn't in this home. Eventually, though, the carpenter would finish the work. And and it looked good on the outside. Yet the carpenter, he felt guilty. This would be his last home. And he knew deep down inside that the quality of this home was not up to his standards. On the day that the home was completed, the owner of the company called everyone together and they thought they were having a retirement celebration. But instead, the boss of the company said this, we are all very aware of your reputation as a builder. We all know how hard you've worked for our clients and for this company throughout your career. So we all wanted to reward you at your retirement. And we're giving you the house that you just built. Carpenter was shocked, right? If only he had known beforehand that this was to be his home. He would have built it with the finest materials and his greatest workmanship. But now it's too late. You know, the parable reminds us that we are building our lives. And much like the carpenter built the house, our home building materials are what we build it with. It includes characteristics such as faith, love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, and kindness. Or maybe the opposites. Our workmanship looks at how we build our lives. Are we living purposefully? working with worship and pursuing excellence in the name of Jesus and for His glory? Or has sloppy workmanship been the story of our lives? You know, I think even for myself, that even as a pastor, too often I forget that I'm building my own home. (laughs) How about you? You know, one day the house building project that is our life It's going to be completed. And each one of us will stand before the Lord and give an account for our workmanship. Hey, don't be like that carpenter in the parable. Be prepared. Build intentionally. Build it right. And worship as you work. See, our motivation ought to be to hear the words of our Savior one day. Well done. Good. And faithful servant. Father, we thank you for this privilege, for the purpose of work. And God, I pray today that as we've looked at many scriptures, that we too would allow our hearts and minds to be changed, and that God, tomorrow we would have a new perspective. Some say you whistle as you work. Lord, our thought would be that we would worship as we work. God, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified. In Christ's name we pray, amen.